We're going to open God's Word this morning, and um, Pastor James and I have been talking for a while about, you know, what do we feel like God wants to say to us, and uh, it's always a little interesting when you've got two different congregations, and, you know, Pastor James will say, I've been kind of preaching this, and I've been, I say, I've been preaching this, and um, hopefully that generally, you know, we're preaching the same gospel, but also we have a strong sense that it seems like God coordinates these things for us. And um, I want to start out in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, and uh, then Brother James is going to come up and talk to us from Philippians. And basically the question that we're dealing with this morning is, what do you do when you find yourself living in a society that says, don't live for God? What do you do when you find yourself in a society, not just in a culture, but sometimes in a workplace you might be in that situation, sometimes in your family. I've known one young woman that um, came to know Christ through a youth ministry I was leading. And she went home to her parents and she said, I want to follow Jesus. I'm a Christian now. And they said, no, you're not. And they took away the Bible that we had given her. And they told her, you can't read your Bible. We don't. And they forbade her from going to youth group. Eventually, they kind of softened on that. But there was a time when she was hiding a Bible in her locker at her public school because at her public school, she was welcome to have it, but she couldn't bring it home. And so she was very motivated to dig into God's Word. She memorized more Scripture in that first six months than I think I ever had a teenager memorize, maybe more than I've ever had an adult memorize, because she said, it doesn't matter what my society says, I'm going to live for God. And that's a new question, and, and it's a subtle question, because some of the ways, honestly, that we as Christians get all paranoid, some of the things that we fight against, I'm like, are we picking the right battles. Um, I have been um, in situations in Kazakhstan, in China, in Vietnam, in Indonesia, in countries around the world. Most of the world, there are legal standards that fight against Christianity. In every one of those countries I just mentioned, it's illegal to lead someone to Christ except for under certain situations and regulations. And for the first time in the United States, Christians face this question. And as I read Daniel chapter 3, I want you to ask yourself, how does this relate? Because this is 2,600 years ago. Daniel chapter 3. Here's what it says. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, just so you can picture that. That's about 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. And set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Now, most of us are already wondering why they put that whole list in there twice. Because they, they, the author here of Daniel, Daniel wants us to understand that we're dealing with a situation where all the powers, all of anybody that's anybody 
was ordered to do this. And they've gathered, and then the herald loudly proclaimed, nation and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. I know this is, for many of us, a familiar story, but think about that. They're being told there's a 90-foot gold image, and if you don't bow, you'll be thrown in a furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and people of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. I do want to stop there. Notice that it says, the, all the nations and people of every language fell down. See, what had happened here was the people of Babylon, the nation, had conquered many people. Many nations who all had their own God. And King, King Nebuchadnezzar has effectively said, I don't care what you come from. I don't care what your culture is. I don't care what your background is. I don't even care what you believe. You must bow. And it says they did. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. The astrologers would have been basically the theologians, the advisors. The, these were the inner circle of this religion because astrology was a big part of it. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews who you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were, men were brought before the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you did not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. I think he paused at that moment. And he looks him in the eye and he says, but if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this manner. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But here, verse 18. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. <coughs> We're going to stop there at that moment. Let's pray for God's word. Lord, just pray that you would speak to our hearts. We pray that you would speak from your word, that our minds and our hearts and our spirits would be changed by the power of your word. Lord, we pray that we would hear from you, that you would change us, that you would make us your people. 
and that we would be like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, we would be courageous in the face of everything we face. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want to say two things that this message is not saying. First of all, the point, the main point here is not be like Daniel. I mean, we should emulate Daniel. That's a good thing. He's a good man. It's not be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's not the main point, although, you know, it's good to have these heroes we look up to. But the main point is that God is able to deliver his people out of anything. God is the point, not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 2,600 years later, God is still the hero of the story. And our, our answer when we face things in our lives is not, I got to try really hard to be like Shadrach. The point is, I've got to depend on God. And the other thing I want to point out here is that the United States is not represented by the people of Israel in this passage. I I know that sounds good, but there is an ongoing theme, and you can read it as you look through Daniel. There are two kinds of kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and then there's the kingdoms of this world. And Ultimately, God has been doing his kingdom work for thousands of years. And in fact, when Jesus came, people thought it was about politics. There were a whole lot of people who wanted God to overthrow, who wanted Jesus to kick out the Romans. And Jesus said clearly, my kingdom is not of this The kingdom that we need to be focused on is the church of Jesus Christ living by the Spirit inside us and among us. So as we look at this passage, here's the background. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has taken the Jewish people into captivity. Now some of them are back in Israel, but he has taken the best and the brightest, the finest young men of the culture, and he has taken them into captivity and into service. In fact, some scholars think that probably Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were also made eunuchs. And if you don't know what that means, um, ask Jim Miedema later. He'll tell you. Because I know he loves to explain that. But... um, And one of the things that we see is that these young men apparently are taken into uh, service and they are standing out. They are not primarily marked by protest. They are marked by integrity and hard work and learning and usefulness. They're doing everything they can to excel in this culture. And I think if I were to stop right here we would have a challenge, wouldn't we? Because it's saying that God's people, when they are living the lives that God has called them to, they will stand out. But they're not going to bow. They're not going to compromise. So, long story short, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego end up in a different situation. They are elevated because they have worked hard. And I want us to ask the question, what is it that did, what did they do that makes us remember this 2,600 years later? If you're taking notes, I have five things that I want to say quick. Number one, their primary identity is in relationship to God's kingdom, not the earthly kingdom. Now, I love our country. I mean, I, I, if you've ever been to Mount Rushmore at, at 
sunset in the summer. They do this amazing show, and they honor the veterans, and it's a powerful moment. And I know our country is not perfect, but, you know, there's a sense in which you're like, yes, I, I love this country, but our primary identity can never be that. In fact, it shouldn't even be like, oh, I'm a child of God and I'm also a Christ, I'm also an American. No, I'm a child of God. Period. I'm a child of God who lives and is loyal to this country, but our primary identity is in relationship to God, not earthly kingdoms. And one of the reasons we know that is that um, in chapter 1, <clears throat> when it talks about Daniel, he was given a new name. In, in chapter 1, verse 7, the chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Beltejazar. And part of the idea was, you know, we're going to change who you are. We're going to teach you. We're going to shape you. We're going to brainwash you. We're going to make you into something else. But Daniel continues to be Daniel. Let me tell you how important that is. Daniel means, depending on who you talk to, either um, God is my judge or God's prince or God is prince. Beltejazar means um, basically um, Satan is Lord. And so there's a battle of identity going on here where Daniel is saying, no, I have been made one thing and I have been created in one way and there's another name. So the number one thing is that your primary identity is in relationship to God's kingdom. Number two, they decided that their first allegiance was to God. And if you read, go back and read chapter one, you'll hear more about that. They decided in advance, I'm going to primarily serve God. And that was the decision that was made. And that, if we dug more into that, you'd see how that's important. Number three, they had established habits of obedience. Now, we don't see this as much in chapter three, but we see it very clearly in chapter 6. See, this happens again. Decades later, there was, um, you know, the, the kings, a new king had taken over, and um, basically they had made a rule that, oh, you know what, I think for 30 days, Nobody should pray to anybody but me. <laughs> a little bit of an ego here. Um, he's saying, uh, you know what? I, I'm going to make a law that nobody can pray to anybody else but me. But in chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, it says this. At, at this, the administrators and the satraps tried to, found grind, tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel. But they were unable to do so. They could not find any corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligence. Finally, they said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Could that be said of us? Oh, there's nothing we could accuse Mark Morris of other than being faithful to God. Sorry. I don't live up to that. And they made this law and they said, you can't bow to anybody else. You can't pray to anybody else. And it says that after they made that announcement, Daniel went home and Daniel prayed as was his custom as was his custom. 
as he had always done before, as was his custom. If they made laws like that in the United States, sometimes I think that what we would do, and I include myself in this, is we would be like, well, I'm going to pray. I haven't been praying much before, but I'm going to start praying. They had established habits of obedience. I heard Alistair Begg say this week, we're often more committed to prayer in the schools than we are to prayer in the church of Jesus Christ. He said, sometimes we want to run around and yell, we have the right to pray, we have the right to pray, we have the right to pray. And Alistair Begg said, why aren't we praying They established habits of obedience. Number four, they trusted God's sovereignty. I love, it's one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. God is able to deliver us, and we think he will, but even if he does not, we will not bow. They have a sense that, you know what? God is in control. It doesn't matter. We burn up, we burn up. We perish, we perish. It doesn't matter because God is in control. Have you noticed how many Christians right now are panicking and running around like, oh, no. Anxiety and despair are never from God because God is in control. And finally, the fifth thing we notice here is that all of these things lead to fearless. After they say that, here's what happens. They throw them in the fire, and in fact, after they've given this speech, the king gets really angry, and so he stokes the fire up. I mean, they're going to throw them in a furnace already. So in some ways, you know, like, well, a hotter fire. I don't know if that's better or worse, but he's angry. They throw them in the fire. It's so hot that the soldiers... Throwing them in are killed. And this is what happens. They throw them in. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. You know, we look at that and we're like, what? Son of the gods. You know, if you think back, who was referred to as the son of God? That's Jesus. Jesus is with them in the fire. And that's why they know they don't have to be scared. They don't have to be worried. They don't have to be anxious. They don't have to despair. If you want to live for God in a society that doesn't always encourage it, the main thing you have to do is you have to remember that you have fearless faith because Jesus is with you in the fire. Jesus is with you in the fire. I want to invite Brother James up, and he's going to um, give his kind of New Testament perspective on this. But as he comes up, I want to remind you that ultimately, in verse 29, the king decrees this. I decree that the people of any nation or language or who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces and their house be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. Ultimately, the glory does not go to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The glory goes to their God. I want to pass this.
on a gospel runway. My job is to land this plane in the heart of the gospel. That's my job. And I'm going to attempt to do that with the help of the Holy Spirit. So Philippians 3, so if those of you that needed a title, if, if I was trying to be politically correct or use pr pronounced prepper grammar, grammar, I would say this world is not our home. But if I was over at the old Missionary Baptist Church, I would say this old world is not our home. Take whichever one you want. Even if God, when, when, when Mark sent me this, we talked about this, we collaborated, he said, even if God doesn't rescue us, and I had to add a, a, a couple of descriptive words, when or how we would like him to. I, I, can't, I can't make a statement that if God doesn't deliver us, because I already know, I, I went to the end and I saw how the book ends, and we do win already at the I know that already. But the problem with the, the, the Israelites and the Jewish people was that he didn't do it the way they thought he should have done it. And don't act like you, don't look down your thumb, your, your nose at them. We're not much different than they are. So it says, as believers, we should all understand that this world is not our home, our permanent home, but it is a temporary mission field. So for those of you that also say that uh, I'm on my way to heaven and I'm so glad my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and nobody can erase it and, 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 and that what God has, has, has ordained me to be in, in heaven with him, I cannot lose my salvation. If that's your main celebration, you've missed it. It was never just about you. We had an old saying I first learned when I was just getting into salvation, said, God always saved you to help save somebody else. We forget about that as we get grown. It's, it's all about my selfish salvation. That don't even sound right, does it? My selfish sal salvation. Philippians 3, and we're going to read it right quick. I'm just going to kind of just read through, and uh, then we'll talk about it for a minute. It says, not that I have, I'm going to start out from verse 12, chapter 3, verse 12, Philippians. It says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has already laid hold of me. I'm not going to kind of stop and exegete every passage, but it's just hard to run past that passage because what he's really saying is that something got a hold of me. Anybody in here, since you've been saved, some got a hold of you like the Holy Spirit, and you find yourself chasing after that thing that got a hold on you. I, I want more of that. I, I want that experience. That's what made me afraid. I'm not, I'm not comparing the two, but that's the reason why I was always afraid to do drugs because they said that there are some drugs out there you try one time, you spend the rest of your life chasing that feeling. And that was something I couldn't take a chance with because I already want to spend my, the rest of my life chasing Jesus. So as we look at this, he said, God has allowed us to remain in the earth realm uh, to have more opportunities to lead others to Christ. Every believer should have a common goal of being a disciple maker. That should be your goal. Not that I'm all, okay, your, your ticket is punched. What about those that you're walking past every day? What about those in your family across from the dinner table that uh, at, at them family barbecues that you know are not saved? 13 says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Not preaching that passage today, that, that part. You know, I, everybody preaches that, and that's a great passage. And if I had time, I would do one of Mark's, Pastor Mark's uh, uh, illustrations where I have some big guy come up here and hold my hand back, and then I have some other guy I'm reaching for him, but we don't have time for that. But that's what that says, though. I can't move forward while I'm still holding on behind me. I got to let some things go. And the reason why sin is one of the things you can kind of let go, even though there's still kind of some stains and some residue, is because God paid it all. That's what makes it difficult because you know when you look at yourself, you still see yourself as that sinful person, as that person that made those mistakes. But God's saying, look, I don't see you like that anymore. So it says, therefore, let 
us as many as are mature. We're doing a study down the hallway, and we're done with it. It was about the different levels of learning, uh, student learning in the Bible. What, what type of student are you? Are you a level one, level five, level three? And, and we see here this first one says that I'm, I'm, what Paul is saying, I'm not what I need to be, but I'm not what I used to be. That's level one. I have least, the train has at least left the station. It hadn't got far, but, it's, but at least it's, it's, it's some forward momentum. Now, now the scripture segues into level two or level three because it says for the mature saints. The first ones were not mature, but at least they were in the game. Once you get in the game, you can't stay there or you can't become satisfied. You have to say, what is the next level in the game? Dr. Lane, one of the students here, there, uh, thank God for him. He, we, we, we had a guy that came in and gave a talk to us uh, last Friday, and he was saying that, man, he said, in order to be in the game, he says, you got to continue to press your way. He said, I, I want to be the one that they say, man, I'm the first one at, at work. I'm the last one at work. I'm the one that's showing, throwing emails when nobody else, I'm responding. In other words, he said, I don't want to just be in the game. I want to be top in the game. I want to I, I be, make a difference in the game. It says here, therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. What mind are you talking about, Paul? And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. So Philippians 3, as we look at it, it says, Paul is simply thanking God that he has left the stations. He's not at the same level. Verse 17, as we look at this, 15 says, he switched over. He said, therefore, let us, as many as are mature. So he's saying, let's take, let's kind of transition a little bit. We're not talking to those that are just holding on, those that are just saved. He said, I want to talk to the mature folks. Those of you that not just, and mature doesn't mean, it's not an a, a, a essence of time. You can be mature by your depth of study, your depth of intimacy with God. Doesn't mean because I've been in church for a long time, I'm mature. So it says here in 15, he says, think like this. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, pattern, or, 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 or path. Let us be of the same mind. What mind is he talking about? He's talking about that mind he just got to be talking about. One thing you have to do with people that as you go to the next level, you have to infuse humility. Because as we grow up, we get too grown. We, we, we get too ahead of ourselves. So every time God takes us to a next level, and you can test this for yourself, is, this is a Bible study too, see if it's true or not. Every time God uh, elevates you to the next level, he has to keep you and remind you to be humble. Because we get a, little, a few scriptures on our belt, we, we're, we're a handful. We're a handful. But God has to keep reminding you there's always another level. I like how he says, uh, you ought to be instructors by now, but you still need somebody to teach you. That's, that was trying to get them to take a step down, take a woosah for a minute. Yeah, you, you, you all have been in this word for a while, but you, you got a long way to go. So as he goes on, he says here, he says in 16, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already obtained, he said, we're not there yet. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have for a pattern. So is Paul eagle tripping here? He, he's very confident. He's, he says this, you can follow me. I feel confident telling you all. Do you feel confident telling other people as a believer or as a non-believer, you can follow my Christian pattern? That's a definitive statement. You put yourself on blast when you do that. That's why a lot of people, when they go to a job, they don't tell people they say because they don't want to have to live that life. I want to be a secret agent Christian. So don't nobody kind of hold me to nothing. Forget about that holiness stuff. I want to live like everybody else is there. But on Sunday, I want to put on my Christian cape and kind of hide in there with the rest of the Christians. I tell people right off the bat, I say, hey, I'm a believer. And matter of fact, we ought to go a little bit further. We want to be honest with people. If you catch me doing anything that's not in the Bible, you, gotta, you, you have a right to, to pull, me, pull my collar. We don't do that. So as we go on, now he switches gears again. First he's saying, you can follow me and those that follow. There's a disclaimer. 
I don't believe that you should follow any pastor blindly. I think that you, 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 you can follow Paul, you can follow Pastor, Pastor Mark, you can follow people, as long as they're following Christ. That don't mean that I, I have to follow Mark anywhere he asks me to follow him. I tell people that, that I serve, if any time I ask you to follow me and you see that I'm not following the word of God, God supersedes me any time. So when they look at this, here, here comes to where Paul gets sad again. Pa Paul was, was, was on a roller coaster. Look what he says here. He says, for many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction. Now, you can link yourself with these people if you want to, but I'm about to get ready to show you some things that you don't want to be Association, you don't want to be guilty by this association. This is a bad association. So as we look at it, it says here, the verse 17, Paul's not eagle triple 18 uh, through 19. Paul is passionately, sadly, definitively describing those that are not brothers and sisters of the body of Christ because they do not have the same father. How do we know they don't have the same father? Look what he says here. He said, because, let's, let's walk down the path. He says, whose end is destruction. This world's not our home. Don't get comfortable with this world because this is how this world ends. It ends in destruction. It ends in sadness. It ends in perversity. It ends in all kind of natural disasters. But those that are in Christ, we already know how it ends. So what does it mean it ends in destruction? Eternally separated from God and eternal judgment. What else does he say? He said, also, don't follow these people. He said, whose God is their bellies. He's not talking about food here. He's talking about those that have an appetite that is so unquenchable is for this world. You, you, you don't have an appetite for God anymore. Anybody remember when you first came into Christ, your appetite for God was much stronger? Let's just be honest. But now, guess what happened? Life happens. Family happens. And we start getting distracted by the very things that God blessed us with. Listen to this statement. I, I know this was from God. It says, anything, these people of God's small g is their bellies, their appetites. They're, they're searching after and they're seeking after anything that brings instant gratification and temporary satisfaction. Instant gratification, but it has temporary satisfaction. It doesn't last. Finally, whose God is their shame. So in other words, because their minds and focus are looking upon earthly things, they are not based on truth. That word is truth. We, we get too focused on things that are outside of the truth. Christians don't even debate about Bible stuff anymore. You, you ever seen Christians now having a debate and there's not even a Bible in the room? Now, I know it's kind of being a, a little bit out there, but I'm saying nobody's going to the Bible to defend what they're arguing about. They're saying, well, society is saying this now. Let's land it in the heart of the gospel. So what are we talking about? Citizenships in heaven. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we all so eagerly wait for the, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we get to the 20, it says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await for salvation from the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ's goal is to transform us to the glorious image of Christ. Now, who heard the scripture before that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God? This is really speaking to that. It's talking about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. All, all the scriptures are coming up in here. So then he goes a little bit further here. He says, I get it. Even those that don't want to go to heaven, but they don't want to die. It says, God does not just want us to long for eternal relationship that is filled with abundance of information. Now, this scripture is saying here, there's an excitement waiting. Paul spoke to this. Anybody remember in, in, in Philippians 1 where Paul says he got a glimpse of heaven? He, he, he just got a, now he, he didn't get a full, I don't think he got a full panoramic view because I think that he'd have been like, hey, I don't care about nobody else, I'm out of here. He got a glimpse of what it means to be spend eternity with Christ. And he said with that glimpse, he said, now, 
I'm already seeing where I want to be. My, my, my goal is set. My eyes is fixed. My mind is made up. He said, I want to go and be with Jesus. He said, but it is more beneficial for you that I stay here. Saints, where are we at today? We, we, we've got a glimpse from the word of God about what heaven looks like, what heaven's going to be like. Are we excited? Are we eager about it? And are we sad because I want to go now, but I got to stay here and evangelize the earth realm? Why are you sad? Why are you sad that you can't go to heaven right now? Because people are going to miss you, because you're going to miss them, because the food. You don't think Paul had people that he cared about? You don't think he had food that he liked? He said, but I, I saw a little bit of heaven. I saw what my citizenship rests in. I, I want to achieve that right now. So finally he says, who will transform your lowly bodies that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the work, working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. This seems like a daunting task. Am I going to make it through? Uh, I, I know what my citizenship is. I know where it's not, but am I going to make it through? So many distractions, so many things that's trying to sidetrack me. Am I going to make it through? Guess what? It's not on you. When Jesus had a conversation with his father, he says, the ones that you've given me, I've not lost one of them. It, it, it didn't say that one has slipped out of my hands. It says that I didn't lose any of them. So it's not on you. It's not on me. It's to lean, trust, and depend on him. You, your citizenship has already been validated. You just have to lean in on him. And so he says, finally, he says, according to, he says, transform it. So what I want to let you know is that it's, this is not about information. Sometimes we in, in church have so much spiritual biblical information. We become spiritual bobbleheads. We know a lot about the Bible, but the Bible doesn't transform anybody anymore. It doesn't conform us, which means sanctify us through our life as we continue to look more and more like him. So I want to ask you today is, your citizenship is not here. Yeah, the one you sit next to your loved one, you love them. I, I, I love my family. I got grandkids coming. I want to see them born. But my focus is, I want to spend eternity with Christ. But since my, since my ticket has been stamped, my ticket has been punched, my job is to get as many people. Now, I understand if it meant that if I can bring somebody else in, it would put my ticket in jeopardy. I would understand you not doing it. But your, set, your ticket is set already. So now don't walk past or ride past anybody without letting them know that there is a better citizenship than this one. There's a home in heaven that's waiting for them. There's an eternal time spent with God that we can spend. Let's pray.